session of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, where we'll be conducting uh, an inquiry uh, into um, uh, devolution capability in Whitehall. Um, we have three witnesses today, and I'd like to ask each of you to identify yourselves in turn. First of all, Jane Brady. Jane, could you just introduce yourself, please? Can she not hear us? Don't. Jane, are, are you muted? I don't. Not hearing us. I don't think she can hear us. All right. I can hear you. Yes. Oh, you can hear us now. Good. Uh, yes, could, I can hear you. Could you uh, introduce yourself for the record, please? Uh, my name is Jane Brady, and I'm the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Thank you. And Dr. Goodall? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Andrew Goodall. I'm the Permanent Secretary for Welsh Government. Uh, and, and finally, uh, uh, Mr. Marks. Afternoon. I'm JP Marks, uh, Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government. Thank you. Well, once again, uh, welcome all. And um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, this inquiry uh, is into devolution capability in Whitehall. And could I ask each of you what you would regard as the characteristics of a Whitehall that is devolution capable, and also how you would assess the current performance of Whitehall against those characteristics? Jane Brady. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the characteristics uh, for um, engaging with Whitehall um, from a a devolved administration perspective covers a number of key elements. Obviously, there is the constitution element, and Northern Ireland has a special position within that, within its own constitution under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, but at the core of any engagement with devolved administrations, uh, the principle for respect, respect and understanding of those devolution settlements. Of course, those are the reserved matters, uh, the, the matters reserved for the UK government in Whitehall, but those that are accepted um, and devolved to the institutions. Um, and in, in, in a, to give those effect, of course, there's institution structures, the departmental structures, the government structures, and where the possibility lies. Um, obviously, within a Northern Ireland context, we have a mandatory four-party coalition uh, which was established under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So the political context is critically important. And indeed, um, over my tenure in the civil service, we have had, I have had two years without an executive um, in my two and a half years um, operation. Um, and the role of the Northern Ireland office um, has been critical in terms of delivering that governance gap and making sure that services were continued within the budgetary um, context. Um, I would say, in terms of the operation of that, much of that is regarding the relationships and personalities which underlie uh, those engagements and, and that, that, that good and ready engagement. And I would say also with my colleagues across the, the DAs, uh, with, with uh, JP and with Andrew, who have been a tremendous support uh, for, for me um, through this period, but also that those common learnings and those support um, with DAs and also my colleagues, not only in the NIO, but in, um, in DLUC as well as indeed um, in Whitehall. Um, the principles that I would say are, are, are underpin that good governance is early engagement, particularly in terms of policies or process um, discussions to understand the context of the, the devolved administration for Northern Ireland in, in our case, um, but also that openness and transparency and building trust as those processes or programmes um, are, are, are developed. And obviously, the, the good communications that must go with building that um, openness uh, and trust, and obviously the flexibility in resolving issues, of which there will be um, in the nature of devolved administrations. Um, there are many structures in place to do that. There are the formal structures and the governmental um, reviews. There is the, uh, the BIC, the, the British Irish Council, um, of which I've attended all across these islands. Um, in, in my tenure, and we have also um, just been party to the establishment of the East West Council, so there's formal structures in place, but there are also the informal structures, a regular engagement with my colleagues in NIO, uh, with my colleagues in DLOC, and indeed my colleagues in the DAs, where we meet every number of weeks in terms of engagement. Uh, my view would be that it was a very positive and collaborative 
uh, related to it in that, in that regard. It will be of no surprise to anyone in, um, that Northern Ireland has gone through quite a bit of transformation in the last uh, couple of years in particular, uh, following the EU exit and the Windsor <laughs> framework, and that spirit of cooperation and engagement and the role of UKG in supporting the restoration of executive has, has been has been really critical um, and key. Um, also, I would say at a, a characteristic level up to indicate that the level of support that, that, that we have engaged to that is our engagement um, at the devolution week and representation. And um, I also have been able to sit on the panel uh, for two DG appointments in Scotland and also in Whitehall in, in DLUC. Um, in addition, my colleagues in the DAs have also sat in the department panels for some of my permanent secretary uh, cohort within Northern Ireland. So that gives a kind of anecdotal representation of, of the strength of those relationships and the impact it has really made in, both in the operational but also the strategic context. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goodall. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I call out four criteria that I think are really useful to uh, use and understand. First of all, to make sure that there is a strong understanding of the respective devolution settlements. Um, I think that allows us to make sure we're able to embrace positive engagement and ensure that we are focused on getting things to happen together. Uh, although, to some extent, uh, there will be variable experiences on that. I think that has been something that I've experienced in my 10 years sitting in Welsh Government and have continued to provide sort of personal support on giving that insight alongside colleagues as well. Um, I think secondly, um, just a regular rhythm of engagement and contact. Um, that's absolutely true uh, on the official side. Um, whilst we need to rely on structures, I think structures are improved when we're also able to discharge them with confidence and with some of those relationships and networks in place. Um, but certainly that rhythm of engagement is also uh, a key requirement in terms of the ministerial oversight that happens. Um, and that's where some of the uh, intergovernment relations framework is helpful to spell out some of those expectations. Um, uh, thirdly, um, just to make sure that when we are working our way through um, the, the range of areas that we are talking um, in dealing with UK government colleagues and certainly where we're uh, on the boundaries of devolved and reserved responsibilities, ju just to make sure that we are discharging a commitment. Um, again, I would say this is uh, for ministers as well as officials to, to use those mechanisms to best effect. I think that allows us to, um, to feel that we are unable to manage that environment. Um, and the fourth uh, criteria that I would uh, share is really about um, we don't just turn up for a conversation when devolution is being discussed. Um, you know, I am part of the UK civil service team. I work alongside my other permanent second secretary colleagues. I uh, interact with JP and with Jane on a very regular basis. But, but the same is true of other departmental permanent secretaries as well. So we're able to, again, discharge those arrangements. Uh, in reverse order on those areas, um, I think we do the latter very well. I absolutely uh, have felt um, since my arrival into post that I am properly part of those arrangements alongside other colleagues and really grateful for that support and the way in which we work in the civil service. I think the, the way in which the mechanisms are discharged um, can be generally good at times, but can be difficult um, in some of the dealings with um, individual departments. Uh, we also need to make sure that we are actively working within those mechanisms ourselves. Um, I, think, I think the rhythm of engagement and the contact um, can be difficult. We've seen that working really well at times, and then we have seen it slip off. Um, but there are some really good examples of interministerial committees that do work with a regular beat, like uh, the meeting between finance ministers, which has, I think, been probably the most successful of those areas. Um, and on the understanding of devolution, uh, I think uh, despite the fact we are 25 years into our devolved arrangements in Wales, I think we just need to continue to work to support colleagues in their understanding and when we spot any areas to offer our support for understanding and vice versa. And there are various mechanisms in place I'm sure we can explore that help us to achieve that. You, you mentioned difficulties in dealing with individual departments. What sort of difficulties do you have in mind? Um, I think sometimes there are departments who have been maybe much more embedded uh, alongside uh, devolved responsibilities. So whilst you may expect this to be at times a more difficult relationship on the one hand, I do think that the way in which uh, Welsh Government has worked alongside DEFRA colleagues over the years has actually been a pretty effective network. We're able to you know, share information, learn from others and bring together 
those reflections. There are professional networks in the middle of those, the way in which the chief veterinary officer works. Um, my own background, as you may be aware, is um, in the health context as a NHS Wales chief executive and director general, and you know, really good and effective relationships in, in place there. There are, however, um, some areas where perhaps um, the contact points have been you know, more, more limited or can be good in some areas, but have been trickier on others. So I've picked these types of issues up with um, permanent secretary colleagues and talking about it, but some of the way in which um, asylum accommodation is worked through from a home office perspective can be difficult in the sense that when areas are being um, looked at uh, in England, there will tend to be a sort of background departmental review of of the expectation of the way in people, people are going to work together, put packages of support in place. Sometimes that works in a more difficult way when it's coming into a devolved government environment because Welsh Government will have many of the responsibilities providing those aspects of support. So just ensuring that there is earlier engagement, I think is probably more my, my request and what we're trying to focus on to make sure we're able to discharge those well because we are able to provide the appropriate support when we have that very early and effective engagement. Mr Marks. Thanks. So um, maybe just build a bit on uh, Jane and Andrew's contributions, which I uh, agree with. Um, I mean, one place to start for the committee on what does a sort of devolution confident uh, approach look like is to start with the principles from the IGR review, because we recognise those as well defined. So uh, Andrew and Jane have already summarised what good looks like, you know, good constructive relations, mutual respect, a shared role in the governance of uh, four nations, building, maintaining trust, effective comms, sharing information, confidentiality, uh, promoting an understanding and accountability of intergovernmental activity and resolving disputes when they emerge. So we think those principles of what good looks like are, are well defined through the IGR review and builds on a lot of the uh, findings from the Dunlop review as well. Uh, and as Jane and Andrew say, we, we have a lot of good experiences where that does work very well. I would agree with uh, Andrew's point with regards uh, the FISC, the Finance Interministerial Standing Committee, you know, that's met eight times so far under the IGR arrangements. And for us in Scotland, for example, that bilateral relationship between our Deputy First Minister and Chief Secretary led to a revised fiscal framework for Scotland uh, last year. Uh, and that was very much underpinned by exceptional work between Treasury colleagues in Whitehall and uh, my exchequer team uh, in Scotland. Um, maybe just a couple of additional points. I think interchange uh, is an opportunity that we can continue to develop going forwards for us in Scotland we've got you know a minute around 24 fast streamers 45 of my team on uh, UK civil service talent programs and around 240 colleagues a year will move in between uh, UK government departments and the Scottish government and vice versa so that's the level of churn so when I look across my senior team a number of my senior civil servants have been senior civil servants in uh, UK government departments so there's an established understanding of how the DWP, the FCDO, HMRC or, or, or whatever uh, work because colleagues uh, have developed their careers there before moving to us and vice versa as well. Perhaps just the final thing is, uh, and Andrew alludes to this, the point around 25 years into devolution to date and uh, what the future holds is how we make sure we are mainstreaming uh, devolution capability in the way we do good government. Uh, and what I mean by that, for example, if I look at something like green free ports or social security, uh, my team's integrated with UK government teams through shared governance with joint programmes to deliver uh, optimal outcomes uh, from my perspective in Scotland, recognising the mutual dependency we have on systems, on data, uh, and on services in communities. And that works really well, for example, with HMRC, with DWP, uh, with DEFRA, as, as Andrew uh, alluded to, and others as well. So that integration, so colleagues are used to working together day in, day out to affect uh, and deliver uh, for their respective ministers, uh, I think is uh, the sort of confident way of working that I'm continuing to try and encourage uh, here in Scotland. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Marks, briefly uh, the Dunlop review. Um, could I ask you all uh, how you would assess the changes in government relations, intergovernmental relations, uh, since the, the review? Uh, Ms. Brady, would you like to start? I think you're muted. So I would say that kind of since the, the different occasion, and I guess I've been in post for two and a half years, so um, and I was an external appointment to the civil service, so can I give the broader context? Um, but I would say the relationship uh, has remained continued and solid in terms of, of those relationships that we have established um, through both DLOC and through the cabinet office and through the NIO um, functions as well. And, and kind of to echo the points that were made by colleagues earlier um, in terms of the relationships, the formal structures that we have in place, but also those good relationships that have been built up through the pandemic and through the engagement um, for, from those many areas. Um, I guess in terms of the NIO, they've had a really critical role in the past number of years um, with engagement with our departments and looking towards the budget settlement and addressing um, the issues in regard of the uh, governance gap that we've had in the offices of ministers. Thank you. Um, Mr. Marks. So, as I alluded to, I think, you know, there's broad agreement with Dunlop Review um, uh, and the new structures and processes established following the separate IGR review were all positive developments. Um, you know, the Scottish Government agrees with the conclusion that there's a real importance to trust and transparency in the relationship between governments, so they respect to both the constitutional arrangements. I think ultimately, you know, UK Government mm -hmm. colleagues will comment on specific recommendations, so senior cabinet position, new cabinet committee, UK-wide projects, joint ministerial committee, I mentioned staff interchange. I think that has improved and continues to improve. And I guess if I take my personal experience, you know, I spent 20, just under 20 years working in uh, UK government departments now in my third year here. Uh, so I think there is a, a good uh, intent to embed the, the work on staff interchange <laughs> you know, in, the, in the spirit of what could be improved uh, to make further progress, uh, referencing those IGR uh, uh, mechanisms and structures. Uh, I think the, the INC, the FISC, uh, some of the other IMG uh, uh, structures, particularly around things like environment, food, rural affairs, meet pretty regularly. There's good structured engagement, deep understanding and collaboration. But for example, the top um, you know, FM, the First Minister's Prime Minister-led uh, devolved government council uh, in the Dunlop review and then in the IGR review, uh, the view was that that would meet annually. Uh, it's met once so far since 2022. So that's an opportunity going forwards to bring uh, senior principals, ministers together uh, on that annual basis to provide that focal point for um, uh, shared endeavour, which works, to be fair, very well, uh, IMSC and, and at the FISC. I mean, the final point, obviously, and this is alluded to in previous evidence that you've considered, which I've read, uh, you know, Mr. Gove, clearly with his deep understanding of uh, devolution, uh, has played that pivotal role, uh, and particularly, and it sort of explains the, um, the location of the uh, Constitution Governance Group um, uh, between the Cabinet Office and DLUC. Uh, and to an extent that's worked for us, but I can understand, you know, going back to the Dunlop Review, uh, that is an open question for the future, which I'm sure colleagues will continue to reflect on in terms of the optimal location to leverage cross governments, um, uh, coordination to support uh, devolution across four nations. Thanks. Thank you. And Dr. Goodall. Yeah, and just to JP's last point, I, I think that has created um, a regular contact and beat uh, recognising the location in DLUC. Uh, I, I agree that um, its location and where things should be in the future is a, is a wider conversation than just ourselves. But I think that's given confidence with ministers about that beat, uh, including uh, the First Minister of Wales, uh, who has regularly been part of those arrangements as well. But I think it's also helped us to form a relationship and liaise with colleagues at Permanent Secretary and also at the Director General <clears> level within DLUC as well. Um, and I do feel that has been an advantage and an improvement over this 
last couple of years uh, in particular. Um, just on your, your ask about general progress, um, probably important to call out that some of the practicalities of the machinery have actually been um, introduced uh, because whilst the Dunlop Review um, put forward its recommendations, of course, we've been reliant on the intergovernment uh, relations framework to be put in place. And whilst we've been using that machinery, uh, of course, that's been um, uh, until recent uh, weeks and months uh, with the absence of the Northern Ireland executive, although officials have, through Jane, still been able to engage in that. So I, I think the, the ongoing use of that is really important. But as one example of how things can shape up uh, a bit differently in there, the secretariat arrangements, which again was one of the recommendations, have been put in place. Uh, actually, uh, the Secretariat is led by a Welsh government official. That was an appointment through an open competition. The Scottish government, colleagues involved in it, there'll be um, more other, other Welsh representation coming around that table as well. So it does allow us to start to, to show through our own mechanisms here that we are discharging those wider expectations for the way in which our liaison with other departments should work uh, as well. Um, but we, we do need to allow the machinery to settle in uh, and to make sure that we are you know, continuing to use that. And I would in, endorse JP's comment. I, I think it was really good to have that first um, contact of the overall council. But um, I think Dunlop actually suggested twice a year. We, we, we've not seen that frequency coming through yet. And of course, that would be more a matter in liaison with first ministers and, and other representatives. Thank you. And the next question is from Damien Moore. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, panel. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about the role of individuals and how um, significant are the attitudes of ministers into shaping how officials between governments interact and, uh, more importantly, how much notice they take of one another. Um, if uh, Ms Brady wants to answer that one first. You're thank you, Mr Moore. Yeah, thank you, Mr Moore. Apologies. Um, I mean, my engagement obviously has been through the um, engagement predominantly with officials, with, um, and when we had no ministers in place, I would have attended, but obviously giving practical advice in terms of ministerial um, engagement. Um, I, I would, I, I guess, note that in, in terms of reflections on the areas where there has been kind of um, further discussions, it's in a lack of awareness of perhaps the devolved structures within Northern Ireland and the role of myself as not a principal accounting officer um, and, and the departmental structures within the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which are separate from the UK government rather than about personalities and relationships that they're in. I would say I have a very positive relationship with all my officials and colleagues who have lent into the process that we have been in um, th throughout um, this aspect. Obviously, we engage very substantially with um, all the Northern Ireland Secretaries of State, and we've had a number um, during the last number of years who, again, have had to take a governance level role within Northern Ireland setting the budget. Um, but those have been very well um, engaged through the Northern Ireland office. Um, we talked about we, we do not have input change uh, within. Uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service and uh, mm -hmm. and the the, um, the 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 UK Civil Service in regard that we're separate legal entities, um, but we do have availability of secondments. But as a reflection of kind of that interchange of understanding and knowledge, um, I uh, one of our permanent secretaries in the Northern Ireland Civil Service has just recently taken up the role as permanent secretary to the Northern Ireland office. So establishing those core links intrinsically and knowing the actual implications of, of the Northern Ireland constitutional framework, but also those personalities and those engagements. And obviously, um, the Northern Ireland Office is a very significant political context in terms of discussions that they've had for the restoration of the executive. So those formation of those knowledge is really important, in my view, in terms of addressing uh, the restoration, but also the good running and effective uh, governance and delivery of Northern Ireland as we go to set our programme for government um, and our budget going forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr Goodall, please. Uh, uh, yes, uh, just building on, on Jane's comments, I, I, I said as one of my uh, initial four criteria for how we would judge the success is that we need to be able to follow through on the commitment to the mechanisms. Um, and you know, I've seen myself um, some difference in those mechanisms. I've, I've already called out that I think that the, the financial liaison that's occurred does seem to be one of those committees that has shown you know really good outcomes and a build up of the structures and relationships. Um, we, we, of course, from a UK civil service perspective, can expect and ensure that civil servants will liaise um, despite uh, those mechanisms and have contact with each other. 
but inevitably the, the environment in which we discharge those environments you know, can be affected by, by a commitment to some of the regularity of those meetings, uh, perhaps some of the, the, the difficulties that will likely emerge in there, and we need to find a way of working those through. But what, what I would say that even in the most difficult examples at times, and when we're handling areas around legislation and some of those issues which require uh, legislative, legislative consent, uh, not from Welsh Government itself, but actually from uh, the Welsh Parliament, Senate Cymru, um, we do find that um, where there has been an openness and a transparency in liaising on those matters, including legislation, and when we are able to work jointly on those policy initiatives, or when we're able to land joint free, per free port arrangements, that means that there is a co-production from UK government ministers uh, alongside uh, Welsh government ministers, we, we can make those things work very effectively as officials because we take that kind of direction and we're able to support the expectations of our, of our ministers together. Thank you. And, and Mr. Marks? Yeah, so um, ultimately, leadership matters, doesn't it? Uh, and building those relationships and then creating that safe space for empowered teams to work together confidently, I think, is, um, is really important. Uh, if I take an example I alluded to briefly earlier in terms of the fiscal mm -hmm. framework review that uh, we agreed um, last August uh, with the Treasury. Um, you know, my Deputy First Minister, uh, Shona Robeson, said following, you know, I'm very grateful to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury for reaching this deal. It demonstrates an ability to work with the UK government to find pragmatic solutions, willing to engage in a reasonable and genuinely collaborative way. Uh, that, that happened because... Um, you know, Ms. Robeson, the Chief Secretary, but also her predecessors, uh, you know, Mr. Swinney, Ms. Forbes and others, um, having regular bilateral and multilateral engagements with Treasury colleagues, uh, and that will happen around fiscal events, briefing on Barnet consequentials, uh, changes in uh, the fiscal position, um, and the more effort that is put into building those personal relationships uh, I think the higher level of trust, going back to those IGR principles, but then also critically that empowerment. So when there is a conflict and tension, uh, there is also an encouragement for civil servants to work uh, to resolve those in the interest of respective ministers. And you know, I, I do that pretty much on a daily basis, uh, certainly on a weekly basis, with my um, my colleagues across four nations and. Uh, and I think my ministers uh, appreciate that effort because they know it's an important part of um, achieving their goals. Thanks. Thank you. And just moving on from that, do you think more should be done to embed the consideration of devolution earlier in the Whitehall policy process? And do you also think it's getting better? So, so should more be done? Is it getting better? What's your overview of those? Uh, Ms Brady, if you want to go first again, please. I, I uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think um, to to uh, disperse any issues coming to for early engagement is critically important. Uh, we engaged last year in devolution week to provide a briefing on the Belfast um, Good Friday Agreement, and I think there is still um, a lack of awareness um, of the constitutional arrangement for Northern Ireland and the governance structure, which is fundamentally different uh, from the role that, that JP and that Andrew have within their devolution settlement in, in kind of the, the very operational aspects in that we are separate legal entities in the lack of cabinet responsibility, uh, which is necessary as part of a mandatory coalition, uh, our separate legal departments and entities, and, and also the implications of what within a Northern Ireland context is central government and local government. If I take anecdotally looking at the shared prosperity funds and the levying up funds, much of those were based on the model for GB, where, for example, um, uh, housing authorities is entirely within an arm's length body of one of our departments, and there isn't a devolved housing authority. Um, we, uh, we have uh, full, within our departments of infrastructure, control of our transport, our rail, and our, our bus network, and indeed our water systems. So in terms of bidding for some of those projects as part of levelling up and share prosperity, they were not initially open to departments to bid into those, even though that was the broader intent, as I understand, for those funds. So obviously that engagement, those were architected 
with the basis of a different structure. So the understand, and I, I, it would be my view, those were entirely unintentional, unintentional, but actually the early design of those to be architected to reflect the overall scope of what's that, that being delivered into. Obviously, our minister's view is that those funds which were replacing EU funding should have come through the Barnett formula in terms of a consequential and be <clears> delivered in line with that policy intervention. And I would say some of the missions that were developed as well were perhaps not reflective of the challenges that we have in Northern Ireland. Although many of our challenges in terms of productivity and inactivity are, are, are the same, but perhaps um, our view within those wasn't as accurately reflected. So I think there's a the constitutional um, arrangements um, is one key aspect, but also where the line in terms of local government and central government um, align is very important and key. Um, obviously, we need now through the Windsor framework and the EU exit to have very close relationships in terms of the implications for that with um, particularly in our Department of Agriculture and Environment, and we're working really closely with DEFRA, really positive relationships in terms of giving effect to, to that legal now agreement, which is binding. And I guess that has been an example of, of early interaction, um, but actually that will be require an enduring relationship um, as, as we continue to, um, to deliver on the implications of the Windsor Framework. Thank you. That was very useful. Uh, Dr Goodall, please. Yes, we're, we're, we're not at a standing start. We're obviously building up on uh, contacts and interactions over many years, but we need to not be complacent on that. Um, I, I came into Welsh Government back in 2014, and I think uh, I recall that in early 2015, I was involved in, even at that point, um, you know, doing presentations and sessions for wider civil service staff on you know, my uh, insight and understanding of devolved government from a Welsh Government perspective and to share it. Uh, I think the devolution and new program that was introduced um, under Philip Rycroft and we continue to use as, as the backlog to these areas has been really useful to continue uh, and we've you know, developed that into um, amongst other contact points a devolution learning week so really important there that we give um, exposure and access to colleagues on a range of different points we, we've been able to to be part of panels um, describing how we liaise and work with each other uh, but but I think that beyond these labelled events, it's really important to make it mainstream that it is a, a daily experience in many respects of us doing business together. So when we have um, been participating in wider civil service developments, um, our civil service live sessions that occur right across um, um, uh, the UK, for example, and how we liaise on those sorts of areas, I think it's been really important to show that whilst I've of course been at the, the Cardiff event last year, I'll be at the Newport event this year, to show that I'm there alongside um, other senior civil servants, other permanent secretary colleagues and wider staff groups. Uh, from a Wales perspective, um, in terms of understanding devolution, um, actually most of the civil servants in Wales uh, are actually associated with other departments. We have 6,000 staff, but many other departments are located in Wales, discharging functions in Wales, and it's really important to bring together that network as well. But I do think some of the, the practical guidance that we have made available, so the devolution guidance, I, I do think it needs um, a bit of an upgrade, probably to account for um, post-COVID, post-EU exit, where we have lived through some more extraordinary events, perhaps, um, and, and it has been gently updated recently. But I, I do think some of the practical guidance that is on offer to general civil servants within our system that prompts them to think about when they would be thinking of asking for expertise or using contact points or approaching devolved uh, administrations. Uh, actually, there's some really good practical work there that can be picked up. So we don't just want this to be a you know, conceptual conversation. Devolution is something that we're living, breathing every day. And obviously, from the three of our perspectives, devolution is something that we live every day because we're leading our respective organisations, of course. Thank you very much for that. And Mr. Marks, please. Yes, yeah, so to address the question, uh, first, I think always early engagement is helpful. So, yes. Uh, I think, secondly, there are some good examples where it's improving. Uh, I alluded to some earlier um, uh, with regards to that integrated routine working together to deliver where we have that interdependency uh, devolution of social security income tax green free ports investment zones are a good examples and there are there are many others having said that i think it is also happening in a uh, disrupted and quite regularly contested political environment 
Um, uh, and, and just to bring that to life a bit more, you know, so my cabinet secretary for Constitution, External Affairs and Culture, Angus Robertson, wrote to the Scottish Affairs Committee in September 2023, where he sets out quite clearly the Scottish Government ministerial position with regards to that last point or visit improving. And that ministerial perspective is set out quite clearly that uh, outside of the European Union, the UK Internal Market Act, and Jane alluded to this with regards to shared prosperity funds, levelling up funds, uh, and also uh, common frameworks, uh, has, has created a different operating environment to devolution compared to uh, what went before. And, and you see that evidenced in um, the Sewell Convention and legislative consent. So up to 2018, the Sewell Convention, whereby the UK government would not legislate without consent from devolved governments in devolved areas, was always um, um, uh, observed. And there were no circumstances where that consent was not granted, where the UK government would legislate without consent. But since 2018, there's been 11 occasions where that convention has not been uh, followed. Uh, and, and so to an extent, that reflects a changing nature of the political context post-Brexit uh, and given the UK Internal Market Act. And so I think to improve further, we need to settle into that operating environment and um, uh, make those common frameworks work really well. Uh, and one of the best ways to do that is that early engagement uh, and that clear common understanding of what we're seeking to achieve. Uh, so ultimately we can both respect the devolution settlement, but also support interoperability in the UK where it's, where it's necessary to do so. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie Cowan. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, we want to look at the responsibility for the union and devolution. So what do you think has been the impact of the UK Government moving responsibility for the union and devolution from the Cabinet Office to the Department for Levelling Up, Housing and Communities? I can start with Mr Marks on that, please. So I work very closely with DLOC colleagues, so Sarah Healy, uh, the Perm Sec there, Brendan Thranfel, uh, the second Perm Sec, and genuinely uh, hold them in very high regard. And clearly, Michael Grove, as Secretary of State, has a very deep understanding of both Scotland and devolution, uh, and is regularly, uh, you know, a key principal minister at the heart of the IGR uh, engagements with, with Scottish ministers. Um, so I have not observed a, a downside to date from the move, um, uh, but clearly uh, one of the reasons, or you know, I'm not particularly party to this, but is, you know, the move works because of the individuals involved and their, their deep experience. Uh, Jane can say far better than I can about the, the way in which that worked well with the Windsor framework mm -hmm. and that collaboration with Northern Ireland. Um, but yes, I talk to DLOC colleagues. Um, we meet Andrew, Jane, I, Brendan um, every fortnight uh, and, and we can regularly escalate if we've got an issue or concern. So, so that, that does work well. I suppose ultimately uh, the opportunity at being at the heart of government in the Cabinet Office is that leverage with the Prime Minister, with Number 10, uh, with CDL and across government rapidly, uh, I suspect to an extent, uh, given Michael Goh's role uh, in the UK government, that is still uh, enabled well. But it's something to continue to develop and, and keep an eye on And I'm sure um, Simon and um, the team uh, will continue to keep it under review. Thanks. I'm wondering, you've mentioned Mr Gove a couple of times there, and also the good working relationship you've got with the people in his department. But I'm asking, is that the right department? And is, if these were the same people working in the Cabinet Office, you could be saying the same thing. In the long term, people will move on. Is the department deal up the right place to have this particular role? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I 
have a definitive answer for you. Um, it's okay. Uh, you, do, you, do, you, don't, you don't have to have. That's fine. That's fine. No, no, no. Do, do you know what I mean? So on, on the one hand, I do think there is a lot to be said for trying to mainstream devolution into business as usual. So it works as routine uh, in the way in which we work with government departments. So if I'm dealing with a fiscal event, I'm working bilaterally with the Treasury. If I'm dealing with a common framework issue to, to do with single-use plastics, my team are working directly with DEFRA. Uh, the idea of it necessarily um, uh, operating through a central function to then be coordinated sometimes actually adds <coughs> delay and risk. Uh, and, and I want to build those integrated governance arrangements. Uh, and so mainstreaming is perhaps more important to me than where the unit sits. But, but I agree there's a risk that the unit might lose its leverage and impact if it's not kept under careful review with good senior leadership. But to date, my view is that it's worked well. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think Ms. Brady, you were looking to come in there, were you? Um, yes, I'm very happy to come in. Um, I guess my experience has been briefly uh, before it was devolved to, to DLOC when Sue Gray was in post. Obviously, Sue had a very significant knowledge of Northern Ireland, having been in the Department of Finance, Permanent Secretary here, um, and then integrated then in the transfer between Cabinet Office and, and DLUC. I would say it's about the people and the relationships, of which those have all been very strong. Um, I work closely with Sarah, um, and I was indeed asked to be in the appointing panel for the second Prime Sec for, for DLUC. Um, I would say in terms of, we have had a significant engagement because the UK government and the NIO and, and, uh, and DLUC have had a significant role in terms of the restoration of the executive and indeed the governance uh, in the absence of um, an executive in the last couple of years. And it has been seen as to me, there has been representatives, obviously, key individuals within DLUC leading some of those discussions and negotiations with representation from number of ten, number 10 team in the cabinet office and indeed NIO uh, and I have always felt I, I've known the pathway through that system and there has been a collaborative um, aspect to drive that forward and indeed um, the uh, Simon case has also been engaged in terms of that process indeed he was supposed to be here uh, last week in terms of supporting those in initiatives so Albeit Northern Ireland is one of the smaller, or is the smallest DA, there has been an availability to actually leverage that overall um, collective aspect to, to support those, those areas and issues. So I haven't seen the restructuring to be a core issue in itself, that the, the delivery and functions um, ha, has been there to support during that period as well. The committee has received strong criticism from the Northern Ireland Department of Finance regarding the performance of DLUC. Uh, they said a devolution committee, a devolution capacity, or capability, sorry, remains a significant concern. They also said there's been some improvement with the devolution without, uh, with, within DLUC. It does not go far enough, and it does not appear that lessons are being learned or applied. Do you recognise that? Um, yes, I think it refers to my comments that were made earlier and the correspondence, obviously, that the uh, Department of Finance Minister has made in that regard. Uh, it calls out the understanding of the local government versus central government uh, position in terms of administration of, of those funds and um, initially in the structuring of those funds uh, they did not allow departments to bid into them it, that has now been opened up to department for infrastructure i'm, I'm, um, I'm, so going, to, I'm was, going to go back to that in a minute but for me we'd like to let a good answer my initial question before i push on yeah i i, I recognize um from both a perspective uh, pers Perception and also in terms of the benefits, uh, how that call for uh, a central role around cabinet office can really work. Obviously, that was a very clear recommendation from Dunlop at the time. I think if you were um, offering me a binary choice between um, shifting to the cabinet office oversight um, or securing departmental um, capability and understanding of devolution, I think I would choose the departmental understanding because there is a danger of almost having a false assurance sometimes by some of those central coordinating roles when what we're trying to do, uh, hopefully through our own evidence, is to find a way in which this is simply mainstreamed in respect of, of the understanding of how we interact across those devolved and reserved uh, responsibilities. Um, in respect of uh, the DLUC experience, like other colleagues have said, you know, we've worked with the structures that are there, I found that very effective, liaising with officials and working through. Uh, we, we have two different and uh, uh, potentially frustrating experiences maybe as we handle there. On the one hand, I think we've got a really positive template 
liaising on free ports, investment zones, where we've managed to demonstrate that we can bring together a Welsh government perspective with UK government and actually as officials be directed um, jointly to, to get on with those arrangements to really good outcomes. Um, what Welsh ministers have expressed some of their frustration on the way in which the shared prosperity uh, fund arrangements have worked in respect to co co-design, co-production approach and co-decision making to happen in the right way. But I, I think we have sufficient examples of what really works when we're trying to blend together the best and make complex. confidence in those mechanisms and share them more widely as well. There is an argument that the, the Department for Levelling Up is using the long-term plans for towns to bypass the devolved powers and in doing so is undermining the attempts to create a better working uh, relationship between the UK government and devolved powers. Do, do you recognise this? Anybody? First come, first served. Yeah, it's uh, JP Marks here. Well, I think um, you know, I alluded to the, the reference to Angus Robertson's correspondence from the autumn. But I think he would agree with uh, that concern. And you know, Scottish government ministers have regularly expressed their preference that the shared prosperity fund, uh, the levelling up funds, rather than being uh, directed um, direct to local government, should um, come via devolved government, uh, and that that would enable a more strategic coherence given our role in economic development, regional development, and housing and transport and all the rest of it. So uh, that, that is our preference as a Scottish government, uh, and, and it clearly is one of the opportunities for the future. Um, uh, but currently, given the approach that is taken, uh, we seek to make the best of uh, the approach that is, that is in place. Uh, and that, that is particularly about saying where, where funds are allocated into local communities, for example, can they then be pooled and work well within, you know, city deals, regional growth deals, uh, as, as best possible. Uh, thanks. It would be a very similar experience from a Welsh government perspective. Um, we have other examples of joint mechanisms that can work very effectively. So the, the city deals arrangements that bring together, you know, stakeholders alongside respective governments, you know, ha has worked well. We've been able to deploy that successfully. Uh, I mentioned the report example. Um, I, I, I've uh, been uh, in the room with uh, the former First Minister of Wales as he's um, you know, talked through how he would wish that it was more of a co-design process. But in some respects, um, the offer I think that has been missed potentially in that uh, has the, um, as JP was saying, we've been unable to line up other resources that may well be available to the same outcomes and to the same effect. So probably we are diluting some of the available funding that is available from all partners in Wales on some of these individual areas. So just thought it was worth um, giving you that impression, having heard it from the First Minister of Wales, for example. Thanks. Anything to add? Ms Brady? Uh, thank you. Um, um, I, I guess I would just kind of summarise some of the points made regarding the um, the early engagement in terms of understanding. We talked about some of the funds that, that were mentioned and the correspondence um, that was made in evidence uh, from the finance minister in Northern Ireland. Uh, but those were calling out regarding systems and stru funding structures which were, were designed um, as proposed would not necessarily understand in the full implications of the Northern Ireland constitutional arrangement, but also our local government and, and central government aspects. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tom Randall. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, a couple of questions on the role of territorial officers in the UK governance group, if I, I may. Um, can you explain how and when your respective administrations deal with the territorial officers? If I could start with John Paul Marks, please. Yeah, so a few few examples. Um, uh, one of them is very clearly in that ceremonial uh, position. Uh, I was at Edinburgh Castle the other day for the ceremony for the movement of the Stone of Destiny uh, with Alistair Jack and the First Minister. Uh, and, and there will be regular uh, joint attendance to ceremonial events uh, for the Secretary of State of Scotland and uh, Scottish Government Ministers. Uh, the second thing is with regards, going back to that point around Sewell Convention and legislative consent, 
Um, so the Scotland office will play that role in relation to the legislative programme and working closely with my Scottish Government Parliament legislation unit uh, on, on matters regarding uh, the LCMs and Scotland Act orders. Uh, and, and they will be part of that liaison um, also with that, um, the government department that is owning that legislation. And then the final element perhaps uh, that I would draw out is in resilient situations. Uh, so um, uh, if, for example, we wanted to uh, seek military assistance, then um, we would uh, engage first with our uh, Scotland Office colleagues for their support uh, in engaging with the MOD uh, and my resilience team have very regular uh, catch-ups with the Scotland Office uh, to talk about um, you know threats and risks to national security or, or security here in Scotland uh, and to make sure we've got that good engagement uh, going on. Thanks. Uh, Dr Goodall. Yep, there, there is a regular liaison uh, with uh, the Wales office. Um, uh, so that is accessed by officials on both sides to talk to each other, often sharing issues, concerns, using that local intelligence, if I could put it in that way, and making sure we can align uh, very much on that. I have a regular contact uh, with the head of the Wales office um, just so that we can maintain our open dialogue and conversations where, where needed. To some extent, however, the the issues that we're handling um, can often tend to be more directly with individual departments. So in terms of um, rolling the sleeves up and getting on to broker arrangements, come together with similar un uh, understandings and get some actions in place, that will tend to be where myself and uh, officials in Welsh Government will be more liaising with the individual UK Government departments more directly rather than via the territorial offices. That doesn't stop the liaison, uh, including on areas of legislation, for example, where it's just uh, worth having the transparent conversation and seeing whether we can liaise and work on those issues together. But, but I think it probably is more effective sometimes working on those departments. And I should say maybe to explain as well, we, we do ourselves um, from a devolved administration perspective, uh, get together um, every fortnight with UK government colleagues. Uh, that has allowed us to build up our own relationship amongst each other and to liaise there. But we're not necessarily in those settings collectively alongside the other territorial, territorial offices, e even if there is a, a direct contact between myself and the Wales office or JP and Scottish office colleagues, et cetera. So maybe that's something that we can reflect on a bit further. Jane Brady, if you to add. Thank you. And, and I perhaps touched on some of these points um, earlier in the role that Northern Ireland Office has, which is different. And I imagine Scotland and Wales in the political context um, and the, um, the, the collapse of devolution during, um, during um, the, the last number of years in particular. Um, and most engagement that, that we would have had, I would have had uh, through the service, has been in the context of the operation of those devolved institutions rather than the kind of more bread and butter governmental issues, um, as Andrew's referenced, those mostly would be through either DALUC or indeed the specific departments, DEF or DERA, for example, um, and the relevant lead uh, Whitehall departments where that, that operation is very good. Um, uh, we, there is obviously a role within the Secretary of State for our intergovernmental reviews, um, the British Irish Council, and most recently last month, the establishment of the East West Council, um, and that will be alongside the DLOC minister um, as well. So it'll be interesting to see how, how, what the role develops in terms of that context. Um, I'd say in kind of the positive aspect, really a uh, critical role in terms of the political talks and facilitation of that process alongside bringing in and engaging uh, Whitehall colleagues um, and in DLOC and, and in, in um, the, the cabinet office. Um, and the arrangement for the decision making, very complex issues for decision making and governance and an understanding of the implications for departments, which was key in the absence of, of ministers. Um, obviously, um, it put civil service in very difficult positions during, during that, that context. Um, I guess that in the areas that maybe kind of towards more tension, it would be in the areas where there's potential overlap between those devolved sphere. Uh, for example, um, economic policy is within the Northern Ireland Civil Service, um, but there is departments of, of prosperity and, and there's maybe the areas of, of tension that, 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 that do um, um, occasionally uh, arise. Uh, on a personal level, I have very good relationships uh, with colleagues I actually had appointed 
uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the individual who's now the head, the Prime Sec of NIO, as Prime Sec within my department book before she moved um, six months ago. So very good relationship we would have regular weekly um, engagements, which is very helpful in terms of uh, um, uh, addressing the, the real-time situation, but also de-escalating um, issues and addressing them as early as we can. Um, in the evidence that you, the three of you have given so far, you, you, you've spoken often about the sort of direct dealings you've had with various government departments um, across Whitehall. In, in evidence to us, David Living, uh, Sir David Livington and Lord Dunlop told us that the territorial office, office ministers play an important role in representing the three nations in the UK government. Would you say that they still serve, a, or do you have any reflection on that, that they serve a, that valuable role? In, in, in representing the, the respective nations. Uh, Mr. Marks first, please. Mr. Marks, sorry. Well, so um, if I think, you know, uh, if I was sat inside the UK cabinet, uh, then does the Secretary of State for Scotland represent Scotland in that forum in that conversation, then I, I, I presume from the Prime Minister's perspective, he does. Uh, and he provides that, uh, that voice uh, to reflect Scotland's interests, uh, what's going on here, and, and to provide that uh, informed uh, opinion and view uh, to his colleagues around the Cabinet table. Um, and he can do that with, uh, you know, some of his other colleagues uh, as well, given their their backgrounds and uh, you know experience uh, growing up or living in Scotland too, so so yes, I think you know as uh, Mr. Lidington was alluding to, that is one of the roles and reasons for the territorial offices and secretaries of state that represent those communities. Uh, the reason I paused was the point about do they represent devolved governments in their articulation of the view, and I think you know. It's clearly a matter of record that there have been points of tension and uh, conflicts uh, where there has not always been agreement, uh, clearly at a ministerial and political level. Uh, an example would be you know, the use of Section 35 under the Scotland Act with regards to the Gender Recognition uh, Act uh, and, and, and the subsequent legal uh, case that followed. Uh, and there are other examples. So. Um, uh, yes, I think it performs that role, but uh, do they represent the views of uh, uh, devolved governments uh, in those forums? Uh, I suspect that is where the IGR mechanisms are, are, are important, so that the First Minister and his cabinet can represent themselves directly, um, because that is what they would always seek and wish to do. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goodall. Yeah, I, there, there will be others who have a, a direct experience of that representation. I've not um, had it myself, but yes, of course, I would expect them to be representing perspectives from Wales and with their own responsibilities. I do agree with JP that um, I don't see how that would translate into representing devolved responsibilities because that's the whole basis of devolution and, and what we've been experiencing over the last 25 years. But, but I, I know that when the um, interministerial meetings have been taking place when we've been using the IGR mechanism, uh, when we were brokering contact um, through the uh, pandemic uh, response and, and using some of these mechanisms with that contact point. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I've heard the Secretary of State say that, um, uh, sorry, um, M Michael uh, Gove uh, declare that he will take away those issues and ensure that they are represented around the cabinet table. And, and I've, I felt that that was uh, discharged in that manner because it was a commitment that was given through those IGR mechanisms. But um, this is where I go back to my earlier point where the regularity of the contact um, and the importance of those mechanisms being, you know, meeting with a pattern is really important so that those views can be represented where appropriately. And of course, there is a very direct uh, opportunity for those that, uh, issues to be represented around the, the council arrangements with the prime minister in the chair and with the other first ministers and representatives, of course. Thank you. Uh, and Jane Brady, if you had anything to add to that at all. Yes, I'm not, I concur with the points that were made by, by JP and Andre. Um, I was also raised, obviously we have a different constitutional arrangement on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and different institutionals 
um, different assembly, different executive structure, um, and um, and we and um, our, our, our first minister, first minister, and the executive would say that it's through that representation that they represent the, the, those parties are elected and fight for that executive, and they they represent the people of Northern Ireland, um, in that regard, um, and that that devolution something that's really important to be respected. Um, in the situation where there was no, no ministers or indeed an executive <clears throat> and we needed to have a governance mechanism for setting the budget, uh, the Secretary of State had an important role in terms of being um, providing that governance function. Obviously that was based on the input um, to, to him from our departments and our, our, our senior civil servants. Um, but. But just to echo the, the points as well, we, know, we would see that the devolved settlement is here and led by the ministers um, within our executive office. Thank, thank you. Um, and just, just moving on, um, and if I could start with you, Jane, Jane Brady, for, for my next question. Um, from your perspective, how has the UK governance group established by Philip Rycroft affected your uh, interactions with Whitehall? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Apologies. Yes, certainly. Uh, from your perspective, how, ha how has the UK governance group established by Philip Rycroft affected your interaction? I haven't seen any particular implications uh, regarding the establishment of that group to the, the continuation um, of our relationship with, with Whitehall. As it said, um, our contacts predominantly are through the DLAC to the NIO and through our connections along with the DAs. So um, I'm not in a position to comment um, as to the implications of that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goodall? Uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, said that I not sat around that mechanism myself. Um, so the representation of uh, ourselves in our permanent secretary roles hasn't happened. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't represent those issues in other fora. I think the fortnightly contact that we have uh, coordinated amongst ourselves with DLAC has been really important. I think that has had an impact on the way in which we have, as officials, liaised on devolution matters and issues and maintained the communication more generally. I would also say, um, the way in which we engage and are part of um, the arrangements alongside other permanent secretary colleagues uh, in their regular meetings. That also ensures that we're able to give those representative devolved administration perspectives around the table in those fora when relevant, rather than only being there when there is a devolution item. So I really welcome those more generally, but the, the mechanism that you've described is probably translated into other things. And I, I, I personally don't use that as my own uh, guide for liaising. So I suppose just a couple of extra points. Certainly in my um, in my time uh, uh, as Prime Second the Scottish Government, uh, certainly in that first year, uh, I had a lot of interaction with Sue Gray um, and and with Jane and Andrew, uh, and and that was located in the Cabinet Office. Uh, I think more akin to uh, what Philip uh, would like to see. Uh, I had a look at his evidence to you and his concerns around the need to build long-term capabilities and to develop a strategic approach to devolution. Um, and, and I would agree with him that for us as a civil service, those are important things to do. Um, and for the uh, and, it, and it is a reflection for you, I think, as a committee and, and for my colleagues uh, in Whitehall to reflect on uh, what happens next with regards to that. We, we've already covered the points with regards to the move to DLUC, um, but clearly, 25 years into devolution, um, the, the question of what does the next 25 years look like uh, and how we navigate the future uh, should be informed by deep capability and thinking. And that will come from uh, building the capabilities that Mr. Rycroft alludes to. So I can see why I think he used the word mourns the, the loss of the group as he first envisaged it. Uh, and I think he would probably like to see it uh, return more to the way in which he uh, he led that group and clearly he did it at a time where that central 
uh, cohesion and coordination was pivotal, um, given the Smith Commission, given the referendum, uh, and then given uh, Brexit and the role he took on later as well. Um, so for someone who spent his whole career almost advocating the importance of this capability, I can understand quite clearly why uh, he continues to see it as a pivotal, a pivotal capability for the future. And, and for someone who leads a, a civil service team in a devolved government, um, you know, I would of course support that, that thinking because uh, the more deep uh, and expert the understanding, uh, the more effective, uh, hopefully, uh, we will be uh, ensuring good government across four nations. Thanks. Well, well, thank you. And if I could just stay with you, uh, John Paul Motts, for, 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 the final, for, for my final question is that um, Lord Dunlop recommended there should be a, a single permanent secretary for the UK governance group, which would include a Northern Ireland office, supported by shared services and a central policy function. I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. And also, um, Philip Rycroft and Sue Gray served as a second permanent secretary to, to that group. And I wondered if you'd support the appointment of a civil servant of a similar status. Yeah, so, so Brendan Threnfall, who, who now leads uh, this um, in Whitehall, is a, is a second permanent secretary now, as Jane uh, referenced earlier, I think sat on, sat on that panel. Um, but look, you know, the, the sort of Lord Dunlop um, and Philip Rycroft hypothesis is you need central leadership, coordination, deep capability. And even if you might feel like you don't need it today because it's mainstreamed and a bit more stable than what it once was, you need it, you might need it for the future. So invest uh, for the long haul. Um, that is ultimately a decision for, uh, you know, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, as I said, from my experience in the last uh, year, year or so since the, the move and since Sue Gray's departure and Brendan stepping into the role, is that it has worked well. But I take the point that was made earlier, is that more to do with personalities than optimal structures? And I think that is a, the right question that needs good consideration uh, long term. Ultimately, I'd quite like a balance of, of both, you know, central cap deep capability with senior leadership with representation right at the top of the civil service, which, as Andrew said earlier, I, I experience. I sit, for example, on the civil service board for the UK civil service. Um, and, and Andrew, Jane and I attend Wednesday morning colleagues, for example, with Simon and the senior team. So, so we, we do bring that leadership to the top of the civil service. Um, but similarly, I want to see that integration on delivery across uh, departments, because I think it's in the day-to-day -day working, whether that be tax, social security, energy consenting, grid connection or whatever, where we get the work done. And actually it's the work that makes the biggest difference to improving outcomes day to day, which has been my main focus uh, in, in the last couple of years. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goodall, I wonder if you had any reflections on those, those points. Uh, y yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, if I refer back to my earlier comments, um, I think there is a danger of chasing a structural answer rather than securing the intention of that arrangement as well. So for example, if if this was to lead to the territorial offices acting as a buffer or an intermediary um, in respect of the way in which we interact with other departments, which has been quite a direct experience, I don't think that would necessarily help. If they were able to adopt um, more of an enabling issue, which is kind of the relationship we build up with them at the moment, that when we spot issues, we can use them um, you know, in the general conversations and progress that's happening, I, I think that's fine. But um, I, I'm more interested in um, not going down a centralised route if, if what it means is it undermines the uh, underlying understanding of departments about the balance of devolved and reserved matters and how we can make sure we secure that capability. And I, I think that's actually the, the wider objective that we're looking to achieve here rather than just a, a, central, a centralisation again in, in our structures. Um, finally, Jane Brady, if you have anything to add to that. Thank you. Um echoing some of the points that previously made and um, my view would be it's, it's um 
its form, uh, I guess its function before the form of that structure. So uh, key for me in terms of our engagement is having official level individuals who understand and have an interest in the in the devolved administration, particularly in, in Northern Ireland. And we have had that uh, with the individuals that we have worked at, whatever department they have, have been engaged in. Um, uh, we had a, a changeover within the NIO from at a, at a perm sec level, and actually, I think it is a very mm -hmm. positive sign that a perm sec from our department has moved in a substantive post into the Northern Ireland office because it's, it's that degree of corporate knowledge of Northern Ireland and the implications and what works. Um, some things are those aren't written down or can't be handed over in terms of a structure. They're about relationships and, and in, in built knowledge. And I guess I would propose that as a positive sign of UKG appointing someone in who has the knowledge of the place within Northern Ireland, which can support us then dealing with the many issues that we have um, um, going ahead. So I, I would have seen the relationships that we had have, have been solid and positive. Obviously, there are challenges in any role, and we have challenges um, in, in Northern Ireland, as there is in my colleagues Scotland and Wales, and there are there are ultimately decisions for our ministers and um, to make our job is to be impartial and provide that impartial advice and that's also to do with the structures and the context of which they're operating in, in, in the other element which i discussed earlier and, and i would say those have largely been been in place um whether there's a, a role for a centralized structure or whether that's individuals regarding uh, responsibility from the um for, from DLOC. i mean that's ultimately for for, for, the, for the UK government to decide how those should be best placed. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next questions are from John McDonnell. Can we talk about the performance of individual government departments? Um, and I don't want to destroy your relationships with your colleagues in Whitehall. <laughs> but but um, hardly anyone's listening to us, so you can be completely candid anyway. Okay. <laughs> so how, how would you assess the performance of different government departments in engaging with your administrations? And are there any particular good examples? Andrew, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. So, yeah, there, there are positive and good uh, relations. I, I can uh, confirm, not least from operational contact, about the good relations that are in place with the Department of Health and Social Care. That was, uh, it continues to be used to good effect. Obviously, there's a lot of sharing of information um, about uh, respective health policies, but actually there are areas where UK government leads on behalf of Wales on a range of areas, and it's really important that we're able to secure those. Um, I referred earlier to our experience of liaising with DEFRA. I, I think that's an area where there is the potential to feel like we are stumbling across each other in that environment. But actually, throughout the course of devolution, I think that relationship has worked um, pretty effectively. Uh, I, I said earlier there are some networks in place that probably help to secure that. But I actually think there are a range of sort of common areas of, of interest from a policy perspective as well that secure that too. Um, Actually, I would say uh, our liaison and dealings from a Welsh Government perspective with the Foreign and Commonwealth, Commonwealth and Development mm. uh, Office, actually that, that's a positive experience from a Welsh Government perspective. The support for um, ministers when they are uh, away discharging inter international activities has always been very supportive and appropriate. Um, uh, we have got uh, Welsh Government um, officials who actually work in offices uh, internationally rather than set up ourselves. Um, and we've seen some really good use of ambassador networks. I mean, most recently on liaison on um, you know, matters uh, around Japan, I had a contact myself, which was really pleased to see, but actually in other respects as well. So a really key issue for, uh, for Wales with our first attendance at the World Cup for a you know, significant number of years was the opportunity to, to raise some of the international profile about Wales. And I, I know the First Minister was very complimentary about the, the role of the FCDO and uh, the UK ambassador to Qatar, for example, just about consolidating those arrangements. So you might not have been expecting that example, but I think that's actually been genuinely a pretty positive relationship over, over recent years as well. Anything that secures football match tickets, I can understand an appreciation of that. But... You mentioned earlier the issue, one example was the issue of the Home Office. That actually reflects yeah. what David Liddington said to us about yeah. that. The, yeah. Where there's reserved matters in departments, that's less effective a relationship as a yeah. result of that. But you also mentioned yeah. the Treasury earlier. Yeah. And the Senate's Finance Committee, its comments on Whitehall departments, particularly the Treasury, it cited the Treasury as lack of engagement with the West Government ahead of significant funding announcements. Is that still the case? 
Yeah, so if I could use the, t the two examples, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, so in, in respect of the Home Office <coughs> engagement, there are, there are many examples where we liaise very effectively, not least on policing matters. That's a pretty fundamental area, although reserved where we are liaising with police's partners around the table in Wales. So there are many good examples of the way in which that is discharged. It's, it's almost um, a technicality um, on, I think, the way in which some of the asylum accommodation worked, because we, we have um, IGR mechanisms in place that are absolutely clear about confidentiality and the way in which we would discharge issues together uh, ahead of announcements and hopefully work through on the practicalities. It, it's simply that um, if there are arrangements happening in Wales, we're, we're sort of dealt with as a stakeholder rather than as a devolved government under the IGR. And in some respects, it doesn't allow us to sit alongside the table with colleagues, perhaps in as transparent a way as they would liaise with the Department of Health and Social Care at UK government level and, and liaise. So I, I just think we need to, to break through that because uh, the confidentiality is, is really secured, I think, by the IGR mechanisms. From a Treasury perspective, if, if I just comment over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, perhaps, but yes, there, there's been contact uh, via the um, Chief Secretary to the Treasury alongside the Finance Ministers that has allowed for some early sight, appropriately so, in my view, of um, likely issues that will impact on Wales from an official's perspective. I've been really pleased that in the fortnightly meetings that we have already described here today, actually whenever there are budget and treasury announcements happening, we have an opportunity to speak to treasury officials within that mechanism. And of course, if there are some more significant areas, then all of us can approach the permanent secretary for the treasury and have that open conversation as well. But, but from a ministerial perspective, there, 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 was, there, there was advice that was given through those more formalized interministerial mm -hmm. contacts and meetings. Yes. Yeah. JP. Thank you. So look, it, it's, a, it's a great question, which I will not, not dodge because that's uh, not helpful. So, I mean, I wrote down some opportunities, I guess, for even better if. Um, uh, well, one example, I think, uh, for us, which we want to encourage is for the engagement to be purposeful, where we are trying to shift the dial on a problem. I alluded earlier to the Islands Forum. Uh, you know, the the UK government arranged for Ofgem to join that uh, forum uh, once in the past. And that, that led to a very good, positive, supportive uh, conversation about how to improve grid connectivity, uh, which is a key enabler for us to deliver Scott winds uh, and to realise the benefits of onshore offshore winds. Um, so uh, we would like to see more of that type of purposeful engagement where we're trying to particularly solve a problem. Uh, an example, you alluded to the, the point around migration earlier. You know, some communities in Scotland, like in Argyll and Butte, uh, other island communities too, face a, a serious concern around depopulation. Uh, and, and so targeted migration uh, reforms are a real opportunity there, but it's quite hard to get that tailoring and targeting uh, up the agenda, given the wider uh, UK uh, debate about immigration. So again, opportunity for the future. I reference levelling up shared prosperity, where we find that approach can be uh, quite tactical and very localised, and we would prefer to see it align with devolution and integrate into established effective collaborative structures like city deals and regional growth. And finally, I alluded to the Seoul Convention where consent has been withheld. Yeah. And I think often that occurs when events are moving very quickly and or there's a political contention that is unresolved. And that's where those IGR mechanisms are, are very important. And we've had experiences, if I take things like recently, you know, the Strikes Act and minimum service levels legislation, which uh, you know appeared quite late on our radar, and uh, our ministers uh, had significant concerns, which they've been very public and open about. Um, so it goes back again to your point earlier about early engagements, <clears throat> uh, particularly when things are contentious, so that they can be resolved rather than late engagement that might uh, actually escalate conflict. So I guess I've given some examples there where there's opportunities to improve the way we work well, particularly with the objective of improving outcomes for the communities we, we, we all serve. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. 
Thank you. Um, maybe to give I mean, a positive example um, in some departments, and I guess we're an area that, that we had some issues previously. Um, if we look towards the, 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 the DLUC uh, position, as it was then in the Lottery Not Funds, the engagement we had, in, you know, we'd worked in terms of providing input into what the structures were, indeed, what our missions are in terms of productivity, uh, net zero, those key aspects, and those weren't reflected in, in, the, in the first iterations of the Lottery Not Funds and iterations. I would say in a reflection as where we are now as part of our restoration proposal, there is the proposition for free ports in, in the perspective of an, an investment zone, which has been, we have worked to, yet to be delivered, but worked uh, with DLUC to provide that around the framework which makes sense within a Northern Ireland economic context with our GVA's challenges with productivity, with our skills challenges with immigration to net zero. So, better aligned um, in terms of our policy direction that our ministers have set. They would equally say that should also be in the context of coming through the Barnet uh, consequential formula. I guess, and it probably be a reflection in terms of our different constitutional arrangements, each department, unless the issue is cross-cutting or has executive approval, would liaise directly with their department within uh with, within ukg so that would not come through necessarily the position of the executive the the, the, the um, and you've seen the correspondence from uh, the department of finance minister in terms of the issues they have raised i would say there has been very substantive engagement in terms of defra and DERA and the outworkings of the windsor framework and um, we provided um 40, oh, 45 people that were seconded from our department of agriculture into defra to support support the delivery of the art workings of the Windsor Framework. So I guess a very integrated uh, model, recognising the complexity uh, for delivery, but also the importance of, of giving effect uh, to, to the Windsor Framework and its, its, its legal and our legal obligations and statutory obligations. The individual departments have their devolution teams. Some of them are teams. Some, some departments, we're told there's even just one, one officer, one civil, civil servant. Just going around again, have you noticed the, an, an impact, uh, of, a positive impact from the devolution teams, Jane? Um, I haven't noticed a difference in terms of yeah. the engagement that hasn't been re reported to me. I mean, our officials work very proactively in terms of behind the scenes and, and those further engagements. So uh, it, it hasn't been noted to me as, as, a, as a detriment or, or, or a difference to be, to be uh, commented on. JP? Yeah, so uh, I have, and I think there are some really exceptional colleagues who lead on devolution in, in the different departments. Um, and I alluded to a, a few earlier, uh, HMRC work very closely with us. For example, if we want to change our income tax system and we yeah. need to impact different scenarios, they do that at an official level. And of course, that is quite politically sensitive work and they do it with a high degree of trust and confidence, which we really appreciate. Um, uh, we talked about the importance of building relationships. I mean, in the last few years, Tamara Finkelstein has brought her senior leadership team here to Edinburgh, so we could have a joint away day on energy reform. Peter Schofield from DWP has done the same thing on social security devolution. We do that as an annual sort of summit. We bring our teams together to make sure we're on track. Um, and, and there are other examples, FCDO recently, Sir, Sir Philip Barton and I have done a, a, a bunch of events together, visiting sites both in Scotland and then in Whitehall, including with the whole ambassador network to ensure that the collaboration on the ground is as good as it can be, given the uh, environment that we're operating in. So yes, I think those devolution teams are really essential uh, to make sure the relationships are in place. They're going those extra miles to build those relationships, preferably face-to-face, -face, so it's uh, it, it has a level of uh, deep trust to it. Um, and then, as I've said before, it's, it's in the way of working, like with HMRC on tax, where we build a competence and capability over time to ensure that um, uh, things are delivered uh, as they must be to, to deliver good public services. Thanks. Andrew? Yeah, it's difficult to comment on the individual teams, but we can certainly comment about um, seeing departments ask questions about devolution areas and policy side. We, we've also got our own 
versions of that. So my constitutional unit in Welsh Government is also available to support colleagues from UK Government departments if they need to translate and have some understanding of those areas in general terms. Um, but, but I think on definitely on some matters of legislation, we, we had some earlier notice of some of the draft legislative proposals associated with the Queen King's speech. I, I thought that departments did lean into us a bit differently in that process. Um, some of the outcomes we saw around the procurement legislation that took place recently, that felt as though that had been uh, directed to sort of liaise with us differently. And I thought the outcome was much more successful. And actually, we were able to use the UK government legislative process to make sure the provision was made appropriately for Wales in that area. So it sort of worked both ways as well. Yeah. Can we just turn the question round then and start with you, Andrew? How would you assess the capability of the devolved administration as you actually lead in dealing with, with, with Whitehall and each other. And do the different structures of your respective government departments affect those interactions? Uh, so, so since I've come into role, uh, maybe even I've been surprised myself about the extent to which I've been personally involved in the interactions. A lot of that with the permission and support from the former First Minister and an expectation that we do have those effective relationships in place. Uh, I thought for a moment you might ask us whether we thought we had some devolved uh, expertise ourselves, and of course my answer to that would be, uh, well I would hope so, <laughs> after 25 years of discharging it. Um, but I, I do think that, um, that we recognise the need for us to be active in that and for us to reach out to our other colleagues. I think JP's description of making sure that we have more regular uh, contacts on issues with other departmental teams, that feels important as well. But I, I also feel that I don't really need to over interfere in those contacts tax because officials from Welsh Government are able to make some of their own decisions about how they want to interact with those departments. You know, I used to have a relationship when I was the Director General for Health and Social Care with the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Health and Social Care, for example, and we need to maintain those arrangements. But yeah, I, I do agree that it works both ways and we have a responsibility to make the best of that relationship for ourselves as well. Now, the point you make about your own experience over 25 years, the, some of the concerns that have been expressed to us is the lack of experience that there is now with, within the devolved administrations, the lack of experience within Whitehall itself, and whether yeah. that's a generational loss. Yeah, well, there may be something there. So I've got five directors general reporting directly into me, three of whom actually have had significant experience of Whitehall, mm -hmm. and I see that as positive in respect of the mix of experiences. There are other colleagues who bring a very strong experience of, of course, working in Wales and in public services more generally. Uh, you know, I come myself outside of the traditional civil service routes and hopefully that adds to this as well but um, I think to secure the future generations we need to maintain some of the work around exchange programs and maintain that so we, we have both UK government colleagues working mm -hmm. in our um, functions and responsibilities and, and we actually have Welsh government officials who are working in the reverse order as well so I think um, securing the confidence of, of those individuals that they can bring bring direct experience to the table as well as having been trained up and developed in matters of devolution is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. JP? Yeah, so ag agree with that. And, um, you know, I think this interchange does really matter. So my chief finance officer, for example, formerly um, uh, of uh, DFID, uh, has a you know, deep understanding of you know, the way in which Treasury accounts works and works very well uh, with, with the Treasury. My, my DG Economy is former chief economist of uh, FCDO, uh, and I've got a, a number, a large proportion of my uh, team have come from HMRC, DWP, uh, Home Office, those departments that have a large presence in Scotland. Um, I mean, we, we do a number of things to improve that understanding of, uh, of Whitehall and how things are changing. Internal Market Act Toolkit, for example, we launched to help people make sure they understand common frameworks and how to work well. Together, our policy profession team, a number of modules on uh, multi-level government and, and how to interact effectively. Um, and, and then just this final point that, that I've been emphasizing about uh, continuing to build the relationships so we don't sort of retreat into our bubbles when things get difficult, whereas actually our, our default should be to lean towards each other uh, when things are harder. To, to find common endeavour. And that, I think, is one of the things I'm working on and encouraging my teams to do and to get down to Whitehall on a regular basis and meet their colleagues and work through the issues and understand different ministers' perspectives and then see if we can find and understand the opportunities in that. So um, it, it's a constant work in progress. 
Um, but but I'm I'm impressed with the quality of the civil service in the Scottish government. It's got deep capability, and, and a lot of colleagues have come from Whitehall departments and understand them well. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I think Northern Ireland civil service are generally well are well aware of where they sit in, in the constitution arrangements and, and the role from the law po uh, policy and their responsibility. Obviously, there are some areas like road service and maintenance, which we provide as part of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which do not require that cross-cutting elements as well, so on, on a needs basis. Um, I would say within departments, there is a very strong awareness of who they engage with at, at their counterparts in those in those departments, and, and there is strong engagement in, in, in that area. We provide learning and development to all Northern Ireland Civil Service with all nine modules to kind of explain the context of, of where we are within uh, the, the UKG and indeed the, the strands that we have as part of the, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Strand one is, is our um, assembly, the east west and the, the north south ministerial um, aspect, and the east west to the, the British Irish Council. So, those are key aspects in terms of the, the, the executive itself and uh, the assembly. I'd say the areas that, that I think there are for more development um, in Northern Ireland civil so service at an official level, we're trying to be more externally faced and more open uh, for. Um, for representation within the civil service. I probably am um, a reflection of that, having come in from a background in business and technology um, a couple of years ago, but equally how we can look towards an interchange, that, that, that looking towards bringing those skills, both from UK civil service and indeed uh, Republic of Ireland civil service and internationally in those different skills mix. And, and in some areas that specialization that we need um, as we deliver equally, you know, substantively complex policy um, developments. We do not have the facility because we are a separate legal entity. Uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service was established in 1920. Indeed, uh, it was established by Irish civil servants when Northern Ireland was established. So our, our pedigree is, is somewhat different. Um, so we our support in terms of staffing into UKG and to the grant as far as secondment opportunities. But I would really very much welcome an opportunity to look towards what frameworks there could be to identify those skills gaps. Um, in one of our uh, British Irish Council meetings, um, we looked towards that as a framework. And I know that our people teams throughout uh, the, the, the representatives of the BIC are working towards a framework proposal which would allow that level of secondment um, of East West and, and North South and, and the other representatives as well, which I think actually towards where we started the conversation an hour and a half about goals about establishing those relationships, that good working and that knowledge of, of the implications um, of what the issues are within the DA, but also knowing who can reach out to um, in those areas which are cross-cutting and which we need engagement uh, um, at a UKG level. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Jane, if I could just continue uh, on that point, you just mentioned, of course, that the Northern Ireland Civil Service is a separate legal entity. Um, <coughs> Lord Maud's uh, recent report said that this uh, was an issue that needed to be resolved one way or the other, that is, having a separate civil service for Northern Ireland, uh, separate from those for uh, Great Britain. Um, what do you think uh, of that view expressed by Lord Moore? Do you think he's right? And if, if so, how could that disparity be ended? So, of course, uh, any discussion of the constitutional arrangements for Northern Ireland would be for those who are elected to, uh, to make that decision. Um, we reflected last year the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Food Friday Agreement, which established the three strands uh, which make uh, in our constitution. Um, and those have delivered a step change in life outcomes for the people in Northern Ireland, not only have they brought us uh, peace um, uh, after the, the, our conflict and troubled past, but they also have allowed us to, to drive to local devolution of policy, a transformation in our economy, uh, in our services, um, and, and, and place us in a much stronger footing. Um, I guess the information and the facts is that we were established in 1920 at the time of creation um, of Northern Ireland um, and those first civil servants were established as part of 
um, a, a development from Dublin Castle. We have not only a separate in terms of civil service and employer in the Department of Finance, who are employers of civil servants in Northern Ireland, are 23,000 staff, but there are indeed nine separate legal entities um, under that, that, that constitution. So in terms of any future restorations or other aspects of, of that, that would be obviously for um, the, those who are party to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and mm. the, those who are elected to make those level of decisions. Do you think, though, that uh, measures could be adopted to ensure closer cooperation between the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the Home Civil Service in, in Great Britain? We've talked earlier, I mean, uh, regarding um, the level of interaction that I have, which is very positive within um, the, the, within my colleagues in the DAs and at the Whitehall level. I attend Wednesday morning colleagues um, alongside Simon, so I'm, I'm party to those discussions. We talked further about uh, uh, representation from Northern Ireland Civil Service taking up uh, permanent positions in the Northern Ireland office. Um, JP has been the appointing panel uh, for some of my current sex in, in the office, and indeed I have been in the appointing panel within Whitehall uh, and within Scotland. So those 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 uh, those positions and relationships are strong. Uh, there are areas in terms of how involved capability where we may always go to do that and get that better awareness. Um, um, but the constitutional arrangements are the constitutional arrangements, and I, as an official, I'm not the person to be providing any direction in terms of how those may or should indeed involve my my role is to to uh, give effect to those constitutional arrangements as a civil servant. Uh, is that cooperation that you've just spoken about reflected uh, all the way down the Northern Ireland civil service from you down to more junior officials? Yes, of course, um, as part of the uh, structures that are in place, the intergovernmental uh, relations and structures that are, are now in place, the, 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 the British Irish Council, um, there are subgroups that are established as part of that and the strands that are now delivered. Um, and, and we uh, have frameworks within each department to deliver on those aspects. Uh, we have now the East West Council obviously established as part of the command paper for the restoration of the executive, and those will form new structures and, and new working groups. Uh, we have the outworkings of some of those areas. We talked about the framework for the comments potentially but between the area, the uh, parties within the, the British and Irish Council. Um, and then we have the operational aspects, of course, in, in some aspects, um, there, there needs to be very close cooperation. To, to deliver the policy intent and our service delivery. And we talked about DEFRA in those areas. Again, indeed, the Home Office and, and the work in terms of um, our asylum seekers and, and, and those areas. In, in DBT um, and in innovation, um, I guess I look towards where Northern Ireland needs to go in the next 25 years. It's the focus on innovation and closing the gap in terms of our productivity levels. And many of those aspects are non-devolved funding aspects into innovation and to research. And I think those are areas where we can establish a better position of Northern Ireland in the context of what it offers an overall UK proposition so we can leverage the opportunity for growing all economies um, as well as providing a pathway to sustainability for Northern Ireland. Thank you. Damien Moore. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just on the subject of interaction, how would you assess the progress made on increasing the number of secondments and interchanges between the UK government and devolved administrations? And also, do you think there should be priorities? Should junior civil servants or senior civil servants be prioritised? Could I ask that to uh, Dr Goodall please, first, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, really important to be maintaining these contacts, uh, the contacts amongst our respective administrations. I, I think um, there are some limits on that. Uh, so some of the budgetary constraints that we've all, all been dealing from a uh, UK civil service perspective and through our own structures will potentially have impacted on some of this. But, but yeah, we currently support uh, colleagues who have come into Welsh Government. There's about 52 UK Government colleagues working for us on our areas of policy and having that experience. Uh, we have uh, eight out from Welsh Government at the moment. Those numbers can go up and go down depending on the opportunities that arise at this stage. So I, I think we need to just maintain a healthy set of exchanges. Um, but to your question about uh, where it's required to be, I think it needs to be a cut through the structures. I think there's something about that more senior representation. And I've already talked about some of the experiences I have around my own Director General table. 
but to some extent making sure that we're able to secure the succession planning arrangements for civil servants who come through the structures with insight and experience of that is really important and I've I've been really pleased to, to do a couple of things. Firstly, um, whenever we have development sessions, when civil service events are on, the ability to talk to all of our staff uh, with all of their different backgrounds has been really important, even to have some smaller conversations with colleagues about aspirations. But um, I know both myself and other colleagues have sponsored, uh, where it's been Welsh Government um, lead, leads, um, uh, various uh, development programmes. And, and I've been really keen as part of those to make sure that if there is a way of bringing people in to experience uh, our assessment of devolution from a Welsh government perspective that we've been part of that so very shortly I'll be joining one of those programs when they're down for a day in Wales I joined one last year when I sponsored one of the development programs myself for UK civil service I was really pleased to welcome all of those colleagues in from all of their different backgrounds into Welsh government as well so I just think we need to continue to build up the jigsaw of experience um, and, and hopefully keep offering that through our own experience as well as others across the UK too. Thank you. Uh, Mr Marks please. And so I think this is a, um, a strength to build on. Uh, I alluded to some of the numbers earlier. Uh, you know, we have good representation on the fast stream uh, here, which is, so, which is good to see. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Marks. Okay. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but you're breaking up quite badly here. Yes. So oh. I don't know whether it's your end or ours. It's just probably me. I'll just try and lean towards the microphone a bit better. Is that, if you could uh, lean away a bit, it might be, be better. I think that. Could you try again? Okay. Yes. Is that uh, that's any good better. now? That's, that's, that's that's better. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so look, I think it's a strength that we should continue to build on in terms of interchange. We've got good representation on the stream, talents are common. Mr. Marks, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but it's, it's all, almost inaudible here. Um, okay. Can, can we switch to, to Jane Brady and then but perhaps one of your technical people could help you your end while, while we do that. If you've got any tech, technical people, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm hopefully okay. Well, have a good technology uh, addressed. Um, so, again, to echo the comments I made earlier, that we are very supportive um, of the comments interchanges uh, because of, of the issues that you would re rehearse. Um, are impossible within um, no ransom service in the UK, but, but uh, we recognise the value and indeed the importance of the comments. We did have an embargo because of resourcing um, up until July 2022, which has been, been lifted. Um, if we look, I guess, towards the scale of that, I think there's an opportunity to, to broaden, particularly in terms of expertise, and, and that's uh, very much welcome, the engagement that we've had as part of the, the British Irish Council to provide some level of framework, both to sign for signpost um, in, uh, inward and outward um, levels of succumbents. Um, at a, a different and varied levels, we have seconded people to the Northern Ireland office um, as part of the um, recent engagement with DEFRA. We have an outward succumbent of 45 staff, and those have been predominantly at the um, the EO2 levels and up to probably at a grade five level in terms of, of seniority. Um, previously, um, to succumbents so um, from UKG and into Northern Ireland, um, Sue Gray came as on a succumbent as part of uh, uh, to lead the Department of Finance um, as their permanent secretary. I think there have been perhaps a reluctance for staff to uproot, and I think uh, the the um, options regarding virtual working has changed that concept, and we should very much lean into that overall in terms of, of, of the concept of a succumbent. Um, and um, and keen also to look towards how that can be done um, across across all, all our regions. Um, um, the nature of this comment is that that, can, that has to be done on a graded transfer, so there is not an opportunity to apply into a promotion. And those some of those areas have, have caused some areas of, of friction in terms of facilitating um, that's a comment. But again, uh, we probably haven't we haven't had the scale that Scotland and Wales have in terms of development. Um, of that because of the lack of an interchange program. Mr. Marks, I see some reinforcements appear to have arrived. <laughs> do you, want, do yeah. you want to have another go? 
Well, I don't know if it's working. That's perfect. So, perfect. Is it? Oh, well, okay. Let's try. We, we might come in with a new laptop. But basically, I, I do think it's a, it's an opportunity and a strength to build on. Uh, there, there's a lot of interchange that goes on. A lot of colleagues on talent programs like the Fast Stream and uh, other development programs. And I talked about the churn that's going on. The final point was simply the UK government's Places for Growth program. I think you know that increasingly provides more confidence to colleagues, whether it's in Wales, in Darlington, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, that if you are uh, moving from a Whitehall department to a devolved government, you can continue your civil service career, uh, given the representation, the increasing representation of the civil service outside of London. Uh, and, and we've seen significant movement in that regard over the recent years, and uh, and that enables that interchange uh, and face-to-face -face collaboration much more. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's been suggested in the past by your predecessors that house prices, geographical background, or where you draw your civil servants from, and the general disruption to people's lives are all obstacles and uh, to these inter inter interactions. So in terms of how we can overcome them, what, what, how do you think we can overcome those obstacles? Is it all about technology or are there other things that we could uh, do? Um, Dr Goodall again, please. Well, I think uh, technology is definitely part of it. We, we are a hybrid org organisation, so we are, um, with the support of uh, ministers and the First Minister, ensuring that we are able to use that to our advantage and that will affect some of the recruitment and give some of the flexibility. Yeah, we. Uh, have international offices who engage with us. We um, were all gathered yesterday um, hearing from the new First Minister of Wales um, we, with all of our staff able to experience that, um, 250 in the room and everybody else joining it from remotely. So I do think technology and flexibility is part of uh, that offer, definitely. But, uh, but I think we do need to think about some of the practicalities and, and how society in general is changing. People are making different judgments. And also, I do think we need to think of younger colleagues coming into the civil service for the first time who perhaps have some different expectations for the way in which they're going to work in that environment as well. So inevitably, financial remuneration award may be one of those areas. But to some extent, what is the offer of flexibility for progression and development as well? So, you know, personally, I'd like to make sure we have a really positive offer from Welsh Government. But the more we can offer short term opportunities where people can dip their toes in the water, have some experiences and hopefully motivate people to want to come back to Welsh Government and to uh, other devolved administrations. I think that would be a good outcome. Thank you. Uh, Miss Brady, please. I think um, probably that the pandemic has put the comfort to that, but actually I would espouse that Northern Ireland is a really fantastic place to bring up your children um, and to, to live in terms of that environment. Um, I think there's a broader Kind of concept as well. Technology also has aided in, in that in terms of that, that uh, level of flexibility. Um, but I think there's also a broader position that I would like to position Northern Ireland and the job in the civil service as is that it is not it doesn't have to be a job for life, that is for many individuals, but actually it is an area where you can helpfully and usefully get very significant learning. And I think Northern Ireland has really great opportunities because so much uh, of the aspects um, of government are within the actual Northern Ireland Civil Service. They're running off our, our water and our trains and our buses, as well as all the policy um, divisions. And of course, as we look towards a new demographic, you very much want to make that impact into life, but give you a better place to work than in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Um, so, so differentiate what that product proposition offering is to encourage others into it. Maybe you know, that can be via secondment or via different routes. Uh, it also can be, you know, and that can be from our private sector, our data ALBs, or academic institutes, or, or other institutions, um, or, or um, administrations. Um, but also that there doesn't have necessarily be that that's commitment for life that we can actually provide a valuable asset from that. And, and maybe we start to what our value proposition is to um, civil servants and employees coming into us. That it's a broader proposition, um, and, and not just about time served, um, but actually what we will actually do and pay, but also what we will learn. And I think the opportunity for secondment ties into a very tangible aspect of that. What you'd be able to, to bring back from your own hearing as well as delivering uh, within within those services. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, before you move on, uh, Ronnie just, Cowan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just very briefly, Mr. March, to drag you back to something you said uh, earlier. You mentioned the jobs leaving London to for, for jobs in the civil service out of the kingdom. I heard you say Darlington and Glasgow, but you didn't mention Aberdeen. And that was one of the promises as well. There were going to be 200 energy-related jobs in Aberdeen, and the latest figure I've heard is uh, 35 by the end of 2027. Is that because the jobs aren't required, or is there some issue in getting people to relocate to Aberdeen? Hopefully, the sounds okay. Um, I, I would have to. I would have to get um, uh, my colleagues to respond to you directly on on that. Uh, I, I don't think there is a labour supply problem uh, in terms of your points. Uh, as you say, there's deep capability in Aberdeen around uh, energy, oil and gas, just transition and uh, green technology. And so uh, it is a huge opportunity uh, for the UK civil service uh, with regards to uh, energy transformation. One of the reasons we have our uh, our green freeport in Cromarty Firth, and why the northeast of Scotland was is so pivotal to to Scotland, um, and I, and I think you know more broadly for Scotland, this is again as Jane was saying, part of our our pitch. You know, we have five of uh, the top universities at the top fifteen in the UK and Scotland now, uh, great capability and talent, uh, and we're increasingly able to say whether it's with the Scottish government or other government departments located here. A career in the civil service is something that you can have across different departments with confidence and a move between uh, central government, devolved government and local government for that matter, um, and build that capability. So no, I hope we'll see more places for growth in Aberdeen as we have Darlington, Glasgow and others. Um, and, um, uh, and, and hopefully places for growth is here to stay. Thanks. Well, but, well, perhaps when you've checked that point about uh, uh, Aberdeen, you could uh, write to us, please, Mr. Marks. D D Damien Moore. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, written evidence we've received from uh, the Department for Education said they had no centralised approach for secondments and interchanges with the devolved administrations. How far does this practice differ between government departments? Quite, we'll, we'll take naming and shaming, if you would like, as well. Uh, Dr Goodall, if you would like to start. Um, it, it's difficult to comment on it, really. So I, I, I don't come here with any notes that say that I, I don't think exchanges happen at all or comments with the Department of Education. We've got a variety um, in a number of different departments, from MOD through to DLUC, and I found it worked very well. So I, I, I don't really have a league table <laughs> uh, of areas. When there's, when, there's a, when there's a need or a specification to have somebody involved, uh, we, we seem to be able to have the pretty open conversation and, and make it happen. Uh, as I said, subject earlier, that I think that some of the budgetary constraints over recent years maybe have acted as a, a bit of a limitation. But um, yeah, I, I could go away and look for you, but uh, I, I've not had anyone tell me it's a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Brady, please. As a reference before, um, we, we don't have interchange um, agreements in place with UKG and our arrangements are via the comments. So all of the posts that I would adver advertise generally are open to the comments as well as substantive um, um, positions. Um, and, and I guess that reflects the different constitutional and the different legal um, instantiation with that. So our, our vehicle for looking at um, increasing engagement would be potentially through the framework that I've discussed earlier, the British Irish Council are bringing together with um, our administrations to look towards a framework for signposting and delivering those principles. All our principles, we have a separate Northern Ireland civil service commissioners and our appointments are based on the uh, merit principle uh, so that they're, they're open um, um, and advertised in terms of the merit. So comment uh, would be um, in the context of that merit principle and of course we have done those previously as well. So the, the level of interchange doesn't rely and that is probably reflected in some of the figures in terms of the comment that we have in place because those are those those um, require certain structures to be in place and commissioners to be invoked. Thank you. Mr Marks please. Yeah I mean I'm not surprised by the uh, DFE evidence because almost by its nature um, um, you know education is totally devolved in, in that regard so we don't have a presence for DFE in Scotland 
in the same way that we do for DWP, HMRC, FCDO, DFID in the past and others. And, and therefore, the opportunity of movement in between those departments in Scotland has been much more significant than, than it has for DFE. Um, there is an intergovernmental placements working group that uh, uh, colleagues have been working on. I know DLUC are looking at a pilot around interchange as well. And I can see my Transport Scotland teams uh, looking at shadowing opportunities with the Department for Transport. So I think there are bilateral arrangements going on and there's opportunities to improve this uh, in the future too. Thanks. Thank you. And then just moving on, both the Dunlop Review and Philip Rycroft, when giving oral evidence to us, said that entry to the senior civil servant should require two to three years experience in or with the devolved policy area would such an approach be beneficial to ministers working with those civil servants? Dr Goodall. Uh, yes, there's a benefit of it. Whether that is a requirement for absolutely everybody going into the senior civil service, I'm not so sure. Uh, there are a range of departments where maybe that isn't the most significant issue. I mean, I welcome the sentiments of it, of course, in terms of how that would definitely bring some different experiences. Um, I do feel we have something to offer. Um, we also take the opportunity, though, of bringing people in with skills from Whitehall ourselves and, and also uh, with experiences from our other public services across Wales. So um, happy to go away and reflect on that more significantly. But uh, again, I'd rather target some of the wider departmental capability and understanding, uh, as I've highlighted in my evidence already over the last couple of hours or so, that, that maybe require that as an individual specification, because I can see that there would be some exceptions, maybe. Okay, thank you. Ms Brady, please. Thank you. Um, I, I would say in terms of, um, to Andrew's point, the, key, the, the requirements for the roles. So obviously within a DLAC capacity, um, the individuals in the senior civil service, it is very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great asset to have had that experience of working with DAs, perhaps not so much in maybe other um, um, permanent sec roles within um, the, the offices. I would say overall, kind of my view is that there is a value in having some specialist capability at the perm sec level overall. Um, you know, within that domain, we our our posts are are, are are generalist in nature within the civil service, but I do see the value in bringing in external expertise um, uh, of which we've seen previously people with a with economy background, and I know the senior civil service has done that as well with, with um, Sarah Mumby's appointment into the service. So I guess getting that diversity of viewpoints around that senior table is very important to cover all those aspects, but whether every uh, individual needs to have that representation experience of that, the, the DA's aspect, some will be required more than others, and indeed I would imagine if they follow the journey within the civil service, uh, there are a few departments which won't have had engagement uh, with, with um, offices uh, in other administrations. Thank you. And Mr Marks, please. Yeah, just just totally agree with that. I think it's something that should be encouraged uh, and welcomed. I think it's positive, uh, but to make it a requirement for all SES roles across the UK civil service, I fear would not be practical, given the volume of SES roles across the UK civil service and the number that we can offer in devolved governments at any one time, given our size. So. Um, but nonetheless, as Andrew Jane said, you know, with the spirit and the intent of that, to deepen real understanding of devolution at all levels uh, is, is to everyone's benefit, including ministers. Um, but uh, I'm not sure it is practical that we could do it for all SES. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And you'll be glad to hear we're coming to the last questions. Um, and they're from Lloyd Russell Moyle. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, um, do you think that the UK Government Civil Service are getting sufficient and effective training for devolution? I mean, the, the people attending training has um, uh, increased exponentially in the last five years. Uh, John Paul. Yeah, so it sounds like you've got some data in front of you which shows that that is improving, which is encouraging. Have um, you noticed the outcome of that in training? Yeah, so I think um, 
as I've alluded to, uh, there is deep capability in understanding devolution in um, particularly those bespoke teams who focus on it, uh, but also in those departments where there's that integration. Um, is there opportunities to go further and do more? I'm, I'm sure there. I'm sure there are. I don't. I don't immediately have an area where I'm. I'm concerned. Um, but you know, I suppose one of the opportunities of you know the regular engagement with DLUC on their capability program, devolution learning week, civil service live, and other areas is as and when things pop up where there is that risk, we're able to openly explain we thought there was a bit of a knowledge gap here. And, and, and encourage colleagues to take the training up that's available. Thanks. Fantastic. I mean, Devolution Week doubled the number of attendants last year. So, I mean, it, it, the figures are, are looking good. Uh, Jane, same question. I mean, and, and I, I guess additionally, how do you make sure it's not just those that are really keen on devolution that attend things like Devolution Week and the devolution training, you know, kind of, and the people who are the naysayers stay in the corner of their office and never actually engage with the issue? Yeah, thank you. And of course, not you know, having a separate civil service creates further complications. So I have actively ensured that I've been involved in devolution uh, week, even though I'm a different civil service to show that representation. Um, and along with panels, uh, with, with, with JP and with Andrew, but also, you know, providing that learning um, and the engagement in terms of, of what the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is and the constitutional agents for that is really important. And I think you're right, the people who turn up and lean into that are the ones who perhaps have, or, or at least um, in, in need of it. I'm not aware actually of what training that UK the civil service provides in terms um, of uh, devolution, and particularly in Northern Ireland. Um, Notwithstanding the positive engagement we have, I am sometimes quite struck by the lack of knowledge of our fundamentally different mm -hmm. constitutional arrangements in Northern Ireland. That there isn't the sample, that there isn't the cabinet kind of responsibility, that those structures which are necessary uh, for for the establishment and uh, for the running of the the uh, the uh, the um, Belfast Good Friday Agreement are not the same as it is in, in Whitehall. So even though those are perhaps intellectually known. But that actually, you know, that I cannot speak to towards a different department's view or lines, such as finance or health, if it isn't an executive position in my role as a, so I think it's it's in the not just in the knowledge of the structures, but actually the implementation and the outworking of those can sometimes be um, more challenging um, as well. So I think you know that and that's with that those officials to engage with us on the day to day that you don't just necessarily get in the training course. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think we need to keep building on the contacts. I, I said earlier in my evidence that I was a little worried that if devolution is the moment when we have the week of events, and then that's the last everybody thinks about it. I don't think we've quite mainstreamed it in the way that we intend it. But I've been really pleased to be alongside JP and Jane at those events ourselves, where I hope we've demonstrated you know, um, our own willingness to help people to understand those areas and to support colleagues uh, alongside. But I can really emphasize how the broader development programs for the civil service, for me, have a different feel around devolution now. If I reverse to when I first joined the civil service in 2014, I'm on the, um, the steering board for our civil <coughs> service live events, which happen across the whole of the UK. Um, and there is a there is um, a really important conversation to make sure that devolution is appearing in the front of the stage in the plenary, right through to the individual breakout groups. And what I've really liked about those approaches is the opportunity to just not try and describe this in a technical way but actually to bring home the impact of what some of that means. So I think there should be um, a curiosity to understand the policy innovation that is happening across um, uh, our respective administrations because civil servants are doing different things to different effect. I remember when we had our first lawmaking powers in Welsh Government, um, I was supporting the then health minister in my NHS role to bring forward the organ donation laws in Wales. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the impact of those, learning from international evidence, they have now been implemented across all of the administrations because of the sort of the learning and the innovation and the best practice that we've done. Um, and we, we have regular policy events where we are allowing us to describe the devolved administration experiences alongside UK government colleagues to hopefully be better in policy in overall terms. So I think it's really good to see the numbers going up. We could technically tick the box, but I, I just think that allowing ourselves to understand the outcomes that are being achieved as a result of these different approaches is also important as well. No, I, I quite agree. Thank you uh, very much. I mean, the, the, um, 
The cabinet manual has not been updated on devolution uh, since 2017, and most of it is based from 2011, so completely ignores post-Brexit, completely ignores the, the kind of changing um, uh, relationships that have been forged from them, and of course, uh, you know, the Windsor Agreement, etc. So. Uh, the, the last question that I've got is, what is your assessment of the current information about devolution um, in the Cabinet Manual and the slightly more updated, but not that much more updated, devolution guidance notes? And should there be a whole-scale update of the devolution guidance notes and then a reflection in the Cabinet Manual to make these um, updates? Or are we just happy bubbling along as we are? Should we, Andrew, should we go with you and do it the other way around this time? Yeah, so I, I touched on a couple of examples earlier. So the devolution guidance has been lightly updated, um, sort of still really generally the same content from 2019, but was looked at again in 2023. But I agree with your sentiments that I don't think that is really um, conveying or setting a framework for the significance of the experiences that we've gone through, um, you know, from EU exit, of course, which has um, had a big effect on the way in which we interact with each other, but actually even from some of the pandemic experiences that we've worked through. So I, mm -hmm. I would uh, argue for that to be upgraded. Uh, I think some translation into the cabinet manual absolutely would make sense uh, for us to go down that route. But I still maintain, um, as I said earlier, that I do think some of the practical guidance that is around and available for civil servants who have a contact, who have, a, have an interest, I do think that the, um, the actual policy guidance that, that's there is, is a really good practical checklist mm -hmm. um, with contact points and the way in which people can you know, understand where they just need to account for the devolved responsibilities as well. But, but obviously, the more up to date we can make it, then the more we can discharge that effectively and professionally across the civil service. So, so, so the policy documents there actually might be updated and, 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 and quite practical, but they haven't been reflected in the updates of the, 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 um, the cabinet uh, the manual, uh, as they yeah. should have been, if, if that's my, my summary. Yeah, not, yeah. yeah, not quite translated across yeah. to that aspect, but we've got elements which definitely I can see have changed as a result of some of the recent evolution okay. experience. Good. Jane, what's your feelings on, on this? Um, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, the updating of manuals is a UKG kind of perspective, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I haven't seen impediments in terms of that. I, I think the the UK, the MOU that we have between uh, the UKG and the MOU, there is merit in looking at, and obviously it hasn't been updated for a period of time. I think the kind of the, the implications for the Windsor framework and the different levels and aspects um, that that has from a constitutional perspective and obviously uh, the requirements and engagement we have, particularly with some departments, uh, there, there, there may be a value in, in reflecting that more broadly um, within um, that guidance as, as things have changed in, in that regard. Um, but it probably isn't reflected in that. It's more on an operational level than how, the moment we have. With Therefore, we have provided training to that perspective within a Northern Ireland um, context as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. And John Paul, last but not least, of course. See, yeah, well, I mean, I just recognize your point a lot has happened in the last few years and um you know Erin martin philip rycroft others have talked about how devolution is a, a journey and a process and, it, and it's sort of constantly uh changing and you know i've referenced some examples of that fiscal framework you've spoken about the dunlop review the igr mechanisms clearly we have some elections ahead of us too so what the next chapter of devolution looks like uh, will need careful leadership uh, and ultimately whether it's the cabinet manual the guidance notes or the capabilities of the civil service we need to make sure they are up to date modern and, and, in, and giving ministers the best possible advice to navigate the future so I, i'm with you on the point that you know this is uh, something that requires constant uh, diligence and, and something we're all the three of us committed to uh, leading as best we can. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you'll be delighted to hear, I'm sure, that that is the last question. It's been a very lengthy session. C can I thank you all uh, for uh, appearing here today and helping us with this inquiry? 
Um, uh, Mr. Marks, I think you're going to let us have a small note on the point raised by uh, Mr. Cowan. And if there is any other aspect of the evidence you've given you'd like to augment, I mean, by all means, please do write to us. But thank you all once again. Order, order. <clears throat>